as I was saying, what I want to kind of cover is, is looking a little bit lower than we would normally look at ASP.NET Core. So typically most people will be familiar with working with maybe the MVC pattern and using controllers and actions in your applications. Um, and a lot of that just works almost by magic. You don't have to do a huge amount of wiring up or code. There's a lot of conventions that mean ASP.NET Core functions as you'd expect. And what I want to do is dive into what's actually happening under there so that we can start to think about places where we might be able to uh, replace some of the default behavior with our own behavior, typically for achieving some kind of cross-cutting concern that you have in the application. So we're going to begin, and we're going to begin right from the very start of this journey where a client wants to make a HTTP request to us. So let's imagine that we've got an API running on stevejgordon.co.uk forward slash API forward slash books, and a client wants to communicate uh, with that API and get some data from it. So the very first stage that we'll just touch on very briefly, and I apologize, the, the animations in this slide that I spent hours on are going to be really janky over about the five frames per second that we get on WebEx, uh, but let's do our best to kind of follow the, the pattern. So the first phase is that the client has this address for a server, and it needs to understand where that server actually is, what server serves that traffic. So we're not going to go diving deep into DNS, but fundamentally there's a, you know, a set of lookups and referrals that may happen through various levels of the domain name system until we come to a domain name server that can provide us back an IP address that we can communicate with. So now we know the IP address of the server that hosts the website. Next, we need to connect to that server and the client, that might be a browser client being controlled by an actual user or it may be a programmatic client, maybe it's C-sharp using HTTP client in the code base to communicate with an API, it needs to connect to that server. So a port's gonna be selected on the client machine for the outbound connection. And then on the web server, we'll either be talking over HTTP, which we'll typically use port 80, or HTTPS over 443. So in this case, let's imagine we're doing uh, the sort of HTTPS because this is gonna be going over a public internet. So the first thing that happens is we need to connect the client to the server and we're going to use uh, TCP. So while we're using HTTP as our application layer protocol, uh, underneath that we have the communication protocol, the transport protocol of TCP. And so there's a brief client server handshake that takes place. The client basically says, hello, are you there? The server says, yeah. Um, and then we establish our connection. Now there's another layer that we then need to have on top of this because of the secured uh, communications that we want. So we layer in the TLS layer, and this requires another set of handshaking to happen between client and server. Client basically is going to get a certificate from the server to verify that they are who they say they are. We'll do a decision on how we're actually going to encrypt traffic and what key exchange we're going to use for that. And then eventually we'll have our TLS connection. The next stage is that the client needs to send the actual HTTP request over the wire. So here is a very basic HTTP request. It's basically just ASCII text. So in the first line here, we have the get uh, method being defined. So this is the HTTP method that we're going to be using for the request, the resource that we want, slash API slash books, and then the protocol version. So 1.1 of HTTP. Then we can have some headers. These are basically key value pairs. So here we have the host header defined, stevejgordon.co.uk. So this will allow the routing system further down uh, and maybe even the web server to determine okay, which actual maybe virtual website am I hosting on my, uh, on my server that can handle this request? So this will help with that routing. Then we have a number of fairly common headers. So accept header is like we prefer JSON in this exchange. Uh, we prefer the English language. We can accept um, encodings that allow supportion, uh, supporting of compression for the request as well and the response. And we also identify who we are with a user agent header. So this is us being a good citizen and saying, yeah, this is kind of who we are. This is the version of us that's talking to you um, so that the downstream service knows who we are. And then we conclude the request with a blank line. All of this so far, we don't have to worry about doing. If you're using something like HTTP client to send the request, it's doing all of this work for you uh, with a sort of an abstraction over what the request message looks like. Next, we actually send the request over the network to the uh, server that we've connected to. And at the other end of that connection in ASP.NET Core, we have Kestrel. Kestrel has been there since ASP.NET Core 1.0. It was at the time a brand new web server written from the ground up by the ASP.NET team and designed to be very efficient and support running the, uh, the web server in process with the web application. So fundamentally, ASP.NET Core applications are just 
a console application. It's a console application that runs a host. That host is the process in the application that basically keeps that process alive, listening for things like shutdown signals from the operating system. And then within the host, that can fire up a web server. And Kestrel conforms to the iServer interface that's defined by that um, set of hosting layer and can actually act then as a server. It binds itself to whatever ports it's been told to and listens for requests coming in. So what this looks like at quite a high level is that the client's going to make its request, potentially over the internet, potentially over an internal network, to the uh, Kestrel web server on, uh, for, on the connection that it's established. Uh, Kestrel then handles all of these requests and these connections through a series of connection middleware. Now, we're not going to go too deep into connection middleware and how that all works inside uh, Kestrel. It's quite a deep topic. But just be aware that if you have particular networking requirements or connection requirements, you can actually write your own connection middleware and register it into Kestrel's kind of request handling pipeline, pretty like, much like you would middleware inside AS Connect Core, what we'll be talking about shortly. Kestrel is going to pass that request then into ASP.NET Core itself. ASP.NET Core is going to do some work, hopefully producing a response, and then that response flows back out uh, through the connection that it's established with the client. If we zoom in a little bit, we'll have a look at what happens in a little bit more detail. So the request has come in, it's reached Kestrel. Kestrel's first job is to parse the HTTP request. So it's getting bytes over the network. And it needs to interpret those bytes as a valid HTTP message. So this involves various steps of parsing the request line, making sure that it includes the method, the resource, the protocol version, parsing out any headers that may be on the request, uh, possibly reading any content in if it's a, a request with content. And ultimately, its job is to translate that into a HTTP context. So this is the object representation uh, that basically covers all of the information that we need through the rest of the system about the ongoing request. So this is essentially the contract between Kestrel and ASP.NET Core. So this carries with it things like details of what headers were found on the request message, uh, what resource are they looking for, so what path, what query string maybe did they include in the URL. Um, and later on, other bits of information get tagged onto this context as it flows through the system. There's a features collection. Uh, this is something that you can use in your middleware and in your applications if you want to apply a feature that basically gets carried around as state with that context and flows through the rest of the request handling pipeline. So this context flows into ASP.NET Core and your application code. You basically create the response within there, and that gets attached to the HTTP context, which gets passed back to Kestrel and then sent over the wire. If we zoom in even further, uh, we can see what happens after we've got that HTTP context. So the next stage inside ASP.NET Core itself is that we're actually going to flow that request uh, and its HTTP context into ASP.NET Core middleware. So ASP.NET Core middleware is a series of components, basically, that have access to the request on the way in and the response on the way out. So why is this useful? Well, middleware basically is a great place for any kind of cross-cutting behaviors, cross-cutting concerns for requests and responses. You register your middleware pipeline, and that gets read at startup and used for the lifetime of that application. And so this means you control exactly what happens to each request as it flows through your system. Each piece of middleware may choose to simply pass the request on to the next middleware in the pipeline. It might um, enrich the request message, so maybe even change values or add on items to the HTTP context or features to the features collection. Um, and then it will pass it on with that change, or it may choose to short circuit the pipeline. Short circuiting is basically where the middleware decides, actually, I can return some kind of valid response. So it will set the response message on the context and then not pass it on to the next middleware in the chain. Instead, it will return back to Kestrel. So each piece of middleware runs in turn. And eventually, once that middleware pipeline is run, it's going to hand off to some endpoint or usually MVC for the rest of the request handling. Once that's built a response, it flows back through the middleware. And this is important. It flows through the middleware again, but in reverse order from what you originally registered it. Um, and so each piece of middleware now has the opportunity to inspect the response that's been added onto that context uh, and maybe make decisions about it, maybe do some kind of metrics and monitoring uh, based on what response is going out of your server, uh, any kind of cross-cutting concern that you have. And then again, that flows out over to the client. This is how we define a middleware pipeline in a, a standard application. So this is the configure method of the startup class. 
So you will hopefully have seen this if you've used ASP.NET Core before. Uh, this is the typical example out of one of the templates. And the configure method has access to the I application builder. This is the, the way that we define all of the pipeline for processing our requests. So we add middleware to that pipeline with these various app.use something methods. So if we take a look at this first one, for example, this one adds in the developer exception page middleware. And this middleware basically takes a request that's had an exception thrown somewhere in the system and writes out the stack trace. So that's really useful during development to understand what went wrong and where it blew up. But that's not something we'd want to leak out into the public internet. We wouldn't want to give people a sort of detailed understanding of how our application works internally. It might be an attack vector. So this piece of middleware is registered conditionally uh, by checking the environment we're running in. So this app starts up, the configure method gets called. And at that point, ASP.NET Core has established what environment it's running in based on environment variables and config settings. The other thing you can use here to potentially opt in or out of middleware at sort of uh, startup is putting uh, conditions around your middleware registrations that use the I configuration as well. So configuration features that you might have uh, set in your app settings.json could control uh, the startup order for your application. The next piece of middleware use HTTPS redirection is uh, a piece of middleware which it sort of produces an example of where we might short circuit the request. So this middleware sees the request coming in. And if the scheme of that request is HTTP and not HTTPS, then this piece of middleware is not going to pass the request on for the rest of the pipeline. Instead, what it's going to do is send back a redirect to the client and say, actually, no, you need to be using this URL that uses HTTPS. So this is how HTTPS is enforced uh, in ASP.NET Core applications. So that's a middleware that sort of makes that selected decision based on interpreting some of the data that's on the request in the HTTP context. We'll come back to some of these other ones in a while. But if we draw that sort of, uh, sort of set of middleware out as a diagram, this is kind of what it looks like. So we have the pipeline being invoked on the left, and then middleware gets in, uh, called in the order it was registered, top to bottom of the configure method. Now, there's one interesting thing on this diagram that some of you may be spotting, and that's two pieces of middleware show up here that aren't in the configure method. And these get registered in a special way by a different part of ASP.NET Core's uh, startup system. There's a feature in there called I startup filter, and this is uh, uh, sorry, a startup filter, and this is uh, an interface that you can implement in your applications um, and register with the DI container. And when ASP.NET Core starts up, it will run each of those startup filters. And the goal of a startup filter is to register middleware into the pipeline right at the beginning of that pipeline. So it doesn't give you as much control over the placement and the ordering of the middleware, but certain kinds of middleware do lend themselves to this. So the two examples that Microsoft place in there by default is host filtering, which is going to look at the host header and see if it matches the allowed hosts for that application. So in your app settings.json, you can define what hosts your web service should actually respond for. Uh, by default, it puts in a star, so it allows any host. But if you do start adding in host, uh, host names that you support, those will get filtered out via that piece of middleware very early in the pipeline. The next one is about dealing with forwarded headers from things like reverse proxies. So typically, we'll put our ASP.NET Core applications behind some kind of load balancer, maybe even a reverse proxy like Nginx, or we may run it behind IIS. Um, and if you do, those are typically going to add sort of X forwarded four type headers onto the request. And what we can do in this middleware is translate those into the standard headers that ASP.NET Core is looking for. So once the endpoint that gets the request uh, handles it and send a response, that response then flows back through that middleware pipeline, this time in reverse order. We can write our own middleware. Um, the middleware is uh, basically in line in this example. So we can use the app.use method here to register this inline middleware. We get access to a context, which is the HTTP context. And the next variable in here relates to the request delegate, which is the next piece of middleware in the pipeline. So inside this method, we can write logic that controls the behavior of this application when it's handling requests. This example is fairly basic. So what we're going to do is start a stopwatch as soon as the request comes to us, and then immediately pass it on to the next middleware in the pipeline. That will flow through all of the middleware. Somewhere the re a response will be generated. The response will gen flow back through the middleware until it reaches us at which point we stop our stopwatch, and in this case, just record a metric. This is a very sort of low-tech way of adding sort of uh, response timing metrics into an application. Um, I do something a bit like this in a real application, just slightly more 
uh, sophisticated. The only problem with this is we do need a service from DI. And although we can get to that by going onto the context, accessing request services, which is the I service provider, and then calling get required service, we're kind of using the service locator pattern here, which isn't super clean. So for anything but really basic middleware, I tend to recommend following the pattern of creating a middleware class. This is a class that's basically your middleware component. And the other thing you can do with these is add them into libraries, NuGet packages, and share them around your business if you have common features that you want to apply to lots of applications. This doesn't require a particular interface. It's all done by a sort of convention and duct typing. So this method, um, constructor here must accept a request delegate, and that is the representation of the next piece of middleware in the pipeline. Anything else that we want to take from DI, we can also have injected into here. Then we have the invoke async method, and we also must provide this, and it must accept the HTTP context representing the current request. The code inside here is basically what we just looked at in line, except now we're using the dependency injected um, iMetric recorder. Um, and our code has all now been sort of nicely wrapped up in this single class. To call this from our application code, then we can now use the use middleware extension method on the I application builder to register our middleware. So in this example, we're registering this really early in the pipeline, so we can time the end-to-end -end request. If you want to get a little bit cleaner with that kind of stuff, and you're building maybe libraries you're sharing around, a good sort of best practice there is to build these extension methods on the I application builder. So inside your extension method, you just call use middleware. But now this means that as a caller, when they're adding this into the pipeline, it's just a little bit cleaner, a little bit clearer what's being added. And all of those uh, middleware that we were seeing added by default use this convention of providing an extension method for registering the middleware. The next thing I want to talk about is endpoint routing. And this is quite a deep topic. Um, it could probably sort of take up a whole uh, session in its own. Uh, but what I'm going to do is try and give you the highlights. So in ASP.NET Core 2.2, the team introduced this endpoint routing feature. Before ASP.NET Core 2.2, what would happen is the request would flow through middleware. And the final piece of middleware would be MVC middleware, usually. And the MVC middleware would receive the request and then use the sort of MVC part of the framework to actually process the request. And inside there, MVC would do all of the logic for figuring out where that request should root, i.e. which controller and which action. Now that worked just, worked just fine, but the problem is it meant that MVC is the only component in the entire sort of application pipeline that can actually know where a request is going to be routed, i.e. what controller and what action. And this means that if we want to do something like authorization, for example, we can't do that until we're inside MVC because we haven't determined yet which action is going to get invoked. And if, if we know what, once we know what that action is, we can determine, does it require authorization? And if so, what level of authorization? So what the team did in 2.2, which wasn't on by default, um, but has since been switched on and made the default pattern in 3.0 and 3.1, is introduce endpoint routing. So with endpoint routing, all of the routing logic has been lifted up outside of MVC, so it stands alone as additional middleware in the application. And what this means is we can do uh, further things based on that routing within inside the middleware pipeline directly. So the easiest way to kind of try and understand this is to take a look at the configure method again. So the first piece of middleware for routing is use routing. And this piece of middleware, when the application is running, is responsible for interpreting what the request is looking for. So is it a GET request and what's the path it's going to? and matching that to one of the known routes for the application. The known routes get figured out at startup, but they can also be updated at runtime as well. So use routing is about figuring out what endpoint is going to be called. The further down middleware here, use endpoints, is about actually invoking that endpoint. So now we know where we're going to send this request, send it there. The bit that is slightly confusing is that within use endpoints, you have this delegate to set up the endpoints. So this doesn't actually happen as the app's running. This kind of happens earlier. And in this case, we're using the convenience method map controllers, which basically means at startup, the application is going to locate all of the controllers in the assembly, find all of the action methods that relate to those controllers, and then figure out how they should map to routing. Uh, so you know, are they get methods? Are they uh, what root attributes do they have? And that will build up this routing table. So these two pieces work together. What this means is that between these two pieces of middleware, we're kind of in what they call the routing zone. This is where we have middleware that now knows where this request is going to end up. And this means that these two pieces of middleware are what we call endpoint aware. 
So this means that they both can understand what endpoint this request is going to end up at, and also have a bunch of metadata about that endpoint that allow them to determine if they need to take action. So user authorization, for example, didn't exist as middleware before 3.0 because it had to happen inside MVC. Now it's middleware because it can look at the request, it can tell which endpoint that's going to map to, and it will be able to check if there's an authorized attribute, for example, on the action method. And if there is, but the user hasn't logged in, then we can return a challenge response to them because we know that they're not allowed to see that without logging in. The easiest way to get a bit of a feel for how this works, and excuse me, sort of leaning in as I, uh, as I demo this, is to actually look uh, at a little sample app. Um, all of the slides and all of the code that I'm going to show you is online. I'll, I'll make sure I point out the link at the end and I'll share it in the chat as well. So you can get a look at all of this. So inside my startup class in my little sample app here, I've got um, two calls to use middleware. So I've got one here before use routing and one after use routing. It's the same piece of middleware, but we're going to run it once before use routing and once after. If we take a look at the code for this, um, it's a fairly simple uh, piece of middleware. Um, and when invoke async gets called, what it's going to do is it's going to first call get endpoint on the HTTP context. And so if endpoint routing has, uh, sorry, use routing has already been called and it's matched this to an endpoint, this will contain details about what, about what that endpoint is. If it hasn't matched, then this will just be null. So in this piece of middleware, I'm just uh, conditionally dumping data out to the logs. So I'm saying if it's of type root endpoint, which is the type that uh, action methods typically are mapped to, then write out the display name, the root pattern that matched it, and any metadata. And if it's null, we'll just uh, write that out. Now, if I run this code in Postman, I'm just going to make a request to one of my endpoints here. And this is coming through that middleware. This is coming through the first time. So this is before we've called um, use routing. So here, the endpoint is null because use routing hasn't yet run to match this to a particular endpoint. So at this point, we can't really do anything based on that root information. But if I continue, it will flow through this, the first middleware, it will flow through user routing, and it will come back in to our second registration of this same middleware. And this time, we do have an endpoint. So this endpoint has some metadata. We know that this is going to go to the books controller and the get method. Uh, we have a bunch of metadata, which is just really a, a collection of any kind of object that we know about this endpoint. So in this case, we can see all of the attributes that apply to the controller and the actions within it. Um, and so this allows us to make decisions by inspecting this. Uh, if we can pull out certain metadata, we might be able to decide on what to do. So for example, if we had the authorized attribute on an action method, that would show up here. And that's exactly what use authorization is using to make determinations about whether or not someone's allowed to continue their request or not. I'll just continue that request. And great, we have, we've got a response there. So after we've run all of the middleware pipeline and the application moved through, um, we're going to uh, then enter into MVC. So MVC is the programming paradigm that hopefully many of you are familiar with. It's the model view controller approach. This is, this is used for sort of web API development still, where we have at least models and controllers. Um, you can use it for UI applications if you're applying views as well. Um, and Razor Pages itself sits on top of this model and is kind of a, a layer over the top. So inside uh, MVC, we have uh, controllers, and this is a basic example. So a controller can derive from controller base, which provides it some default behaviors that we might need. We have the API controller attribute, uh, which is going to add some features on for APIs using some of the techniques we're about to see. It has the root attribute. So this is how the routing system, uh, when it's mapping the controller routes, can determine what the route should be. In this case, the square brackets and controller means use the name, so slash books without the controller suffix. Um, and inside here, we can inject things via dependency injection if we want to, and we can then create action methods. Any public method of a controller is considered an action method by default. Uh, so in this case, the action method is a get. It doesn't have any parameters. Um, it has the HTTP get attribute, which ensures that uh, only get requests will map to this endpoint, and it returns some kind of I action result. Uh, in this case, we're using the action result of T, which basically says we're going to return a result with some data, and this is the type of that data. And in this case, it's using uh, the OK method here, which comes from the controller base, that's going to translate to an OK object result. 
Um, and that object result has an object. In this case, it's the, the list of books that we've retrieved from some repository system. Don't worry too much about action results at the moment. We'll be getting to them in a moment. So next, uh, we'll just take a quick dive into MVC at a 10,000 foot view before we go a little bit deeper. So once we enter MVC, some code is going to run and eventually uh, the controller factory is going to need to create an instance of the controller. So this is where we initialize an instance of the controller per request. Once we have the controller, some more code will run and eventually an action invoker will kick in. And that's, that job there is to actually call your action method. So whatever method has mapped to the request that's being handled. After that, we have that I action result and the I action result doesn't represent data at this point. It represents a strongly typed model of what data and what uh, type of HTTP response we may be sending only gets converted into an actual HTTP response when we execute the I action result. And that happens in the result execution phase. Finally, that data then gets returned. So in the case of an API, normally we're just going to return serialized JSON data. If you're doing uh, something with views, then the view rendering phase takes place here. So the view result, which takes the view, and the model and kind of might combines them together and then executes them to produce HTML will run. We're going to be focusing more on the data result option here. So what happens after uh, we enter MVC is we basically run through what's called the filter pipeline. It's, it's a pipeline that handles how MVC uh, sort of responds to requests internally. Um, and you can kind of think of this really as a very big state machine. MVC is basically a state machine that uh, runs through different states as the request flows through. Uh, bumping it through the various states until it flows back out again. So where this starts from um, is we have the middleware on the left there, which represents the you know the middleware pipeline that we've already seen, and the re request is going to flow from the left. So the first thing that happens inside MVC is I authorization filters will get executed. So I authorization filters are a place where we can run authorization code in the on authorization method. Now, because of endpoint routing today, these pretty much will probably do nothing because now use authorization is its own middleware and has probably already run. Then the authorization filters will be able to detect that and won't run again. Only if uh, use authorization hasn't been called earlier, would authorization kick in inside the MVC feature set itself. You can write your own authorization filter. You implement I authorization filter, uh, but it's really not recommended to do so. Um, the reason for that is there's a whole authorization system inside ASP.NET Core that's built to be uh, very pluggable and very controllable. So the recommended pattern, if you need to customize authorization logic, is to use authorization policies and authorization handlers, maybe even resource base auth. But all of those are kind of higher level features, and the iAuthorization filter that's registered by default will kick in and execute uh, those policies for us. So don't normally want to be modifying these. Authorization filters might short circuit the pipeline. So if someone isn't allowed to um, run, then they will be getting the forbidden result in this case, uh, because we says actually the thing you're trying to access, you're not allowed to see. The next filter in the pipeline is resource filters. Uh, so these kick in immediately after authorization will have run, um, and they have an on resource executing method. And at this point, again, we can do some additional uh, cross cutting concerns that wrap the entire MVC request response pipeline. <clears throat> Excuse me. The only problem with this is that, again, this is a feature that's kind of been taken away. Now that we have the concept of endpoint aware middleware, it's better to write middleware that inspects the endpoints and makes conditional decisions about whether it runs or not. Previously, the reason you'd use an I resource filter is because you'd want to know, and you would know at this stage, which controller and which action is going to get the request. So resource filters do allow us some functionality, though, and we'll take a look at one shortly. Again, a resource filter can short circuit the pipeline if it wants to, uh, returning some kind of result. And then if not, it will pass the request into the rest of MVC. MVC is going to do all of its work and it's going to return the response. And on the way out, on resource executed gets called and we have another final opportunity to potentially change or augment behavior based on the result that's going out. So let's have, have a look at another um, quick demo here. So what I'm going to do is look at an example of a, a very basic resource filter. 
So in this example, uh, what I'm doing, if I just make this fit onto the large font size. Um, so this is an I resource filter. Um, it's got an on resource executing method that we're using. And what we're saying in here is read the response, see if there's a request header called preview. And if there is, what's it va its value? So the idea here is that we're going to have a section of our API that isn't behind authorization, but that does require um, someone to opt in to accessing it because it's not yet complete. So we're saying if they haven't got the preview header or if they've got the header and it's false, then we're going to short circuit the pipeline. We do that by setting the result on the context. So here we're saying just pretend that you couldn't find the resource, turn a not found result. Otherwise, we'll just continue through and we'll just add a response header. And by default, because we haven't set the context, the MVC state machine will just pass this on to either the next filter or to the next part of the processing pipeline. The way I've applied this resource filter is I've got this Office controller in my application. And in this case, I've added my, my filter to the controller. So you can add filters either to action methods or to uh, entire controllers, so all action methods of the controller, or globally for all actions, all controllers. So here we said apply this to anything under authors um, uh, that we want that feature. So this is the method we're going to call here. So hopefully, uh, we'll make our request. Uh, I haven't set any preview headers at the moment, so I make my request and we get a 404 not found response. What's interesting is we never even hit this action method. So because we had a filter in place that short circuited this request pipeline, it never even made it as far as an action method. If I add on a preview header here that has the value of true and resend this request through, you can see now it does hit the action method inside here because it passed through the filter. And if I continue that, um, you can see that we get the, the fake data from this endpoint. So this is one of the ways that we can filter that behavior. Now, today we could write that with endpoint aware middleware, because we could also look for the presence of an attribute on the metadata after that use uh, routing has been called. And we could have middleware that then says, if this attribute is present, apply this same behavior. We'll come back to slides and we'll continue the journey shortly. Uh, so the next filter is middleware filters, and these are really just a special kind of resource filter. And you might wonder why we have a filter for middleware when we can run middleware in the pipeline. And this again stems from the pre endpoint routing days where we might want to apply some middleware, but only selectively to some endpoints. And the only way to do that before endpoint routing was to do it inside the MVC pipeline where we knew the endpoint, uh, where we knew the controller and action that we were going to invoke. So again, middleware filters may short circuit the pipeline. Here's a very basic example. We're not going to use one uh, in, the, in the demos because it's pretty much depreciated now. Um, but basically what you would do is create a class that has a configure method. So very much like the signature of the startup class. And in there, you have the I application builder and you call various methods to add in the middle, middleware that you want. Um, in this case, we're adding the response compression middleware only. And then to conditionally apply that to a controller, you use the middleware filter attribute passing in the type of the um, middleware pipeline that you want to use. And so this means in this example, anything that goes through the Office controller will also run that additional middleware to potentially apply response compression. So all of these first three filters are places we can customize logic, but they're all places where the behavior of doing so has pretty much been replaced by using endpoint routing and the endpoint aware middleware. So if you find yourself writing these, do have a think and see, oh, can we do this if we do get endpoint in our middleware? And then we look at the attributes that are on those endpoints. Can we make the same uh, sort of decisions about whether we're filtering the requests and doing something special with them or not? So the next phase after this initial step is the controller creation. So this is where the uh, factory for creating controllers is going to run. It's going to create an instance of the controller for that particular request. And then the next phase begins, which is all around invoking the action on that, uh, on that controller that we're going to be sending the request through. So the first piece of that, and one of the most important, is model binding. Uh, we have to map any data that we need off of a, a request and match it to parameters of the action method, because the action method we've looked at so far have no parameters. But it's very common, for example, you might have an endpoint that allows you to get data about one particular book. And that might take an int ID uh, as one of its parameters. And so somehow MVC needs to work out what ID you want to pass into that action method when it gets invoked. And that's where model binding comes in. 
So MVC has a suite of model binders uh, by default, and many of these will handle sort of 99% of your scenarios. The model binders are basically responsible for saying, okay, given this type that I'm trying to create, so maybe the int ID, do I have a model binder that can provide integers and map them off of the request? So there's a simple type model binder that's responsible for these kind of basic operations uh, and potentially making sure that the, the data coming in on that request could be uh, set to the value. So it's easier to see that in a little bit of an example. So here we've got a search method, which has two parameters. We have a string keyword and an int page size. So somehow when this action method is invoked, we need that data, we need those parameters. So MVC has a series of what are known as value providers. And these are the, the things that basically inspect parts of the request, like the query string, uh, like the headers, and see if there's values on there that could potentially fulfill the requirements of the action method. So here, for example, we require a keyword on the string. Um, so the value providers are going to be asked, do you have a value that could potentially satisfy this? Well, value providers are essentially a key value sort of lookup. So they say, well, yeah, I've got something called keyword. Here's its value. I'll pump that into this action method when we invoke it. Integers, very similar. So here we have a page size that matches on the query string as well. And as long as the value of that is a valid integer, that could also be used to satisfy this request. Where things get more complex is when you've got um, sort of strongly typed input models for things like post requests. So if we have an endpoint that allows us to post a book into the system, we'll probably accept maybe a book input model. And on there, we'll have a number of properties like ID, title, ISBN number, for example. So we need to get those bound from the data on the request. And most likely that data exists in the actual request body. So this is where input formatters come in. Input formatters can look at the content type of the request coming in and determine, can I take that content and can I turn it into an object? So in the case of MVC by default, there's a JSON input formatter that's registered. So if the content type is application JSON, the uh, model binder will use the input formatter for JSON to try and deserialize the content of the request body and turn it into whatever object we're trying to bind. And so we can use the default input formatter for JSON. We can add a default uh, formatter that is included in the box but not enabled for XML, or you can write your own. If you've got uh, requirements to use protobuf or message pack or your own proprietary binary serialization format, you can write a formatter to interpret that data off of the request. Let's have a quick look at model binding. We won't spend too long on this because, uh, again, it's a feature that you can easily overuse. Um, but I have one example that I have used in practice that I think is fairly reasonable. So here I've got a method which allows us to search for a set of books by the, the date range that they were published within. So my method accepts this date range type. And if we take a look at date range, we'll see it's a fairly simple struct. It's got a start date and an end date. The important thing is these are read only. So these have got getters, but no setters. So the only way to create this object is through the constructor. And then from then on, it's considered immutable. Um, and in here, we do some logic around um, the date as well. So the end date can't be before the start date. That wouldn't be valid for our date range concept. Now, one option, if we wanted to avoid custom model binding here, is that we could just have a simpler type that does have a getter and a setter for the two properties, basically uh, an input model. Um, and we could map to that, and then we could try and create our immutable date range as our domain model inside our controller. Um, and generally, for more complex types, that's pretty reasonable. But for something as simple as this, where we might use this across a number of action methods in our, in our controllers, uh, this, makes, this makes quite a lot of sense. So if we take a look at what the binder looks like quickly, here we basically have uh, the code for binding. And I won't talk about every step here, I'll try and summarize it, and you can take a look at the comments in the code yourself afterwards. Basically, what we're saying is when you're trying to bind, we expect by convention in our system, the start date and end date to have these names on, on some of the data, however it's provided. Uh, that could be in query string, it could be on the root parameters, for example. So then what we say is we ask them, the value provider system, do you have any values with these keys, these names? And it will return to us a result, which can be none, one or many values that match. In this case, if, if we've got none, we haven't got the values we want, what we're going to do is we're going to add a model error to the model state. So the model state is a rep representation of how the binding has gone, basically. And MVC can use this for future 
uh, validation steps in um, handling the response. So the model state here, we add an error saying, okay, we didn't find the start or date or end date, something failed, we set the result as failed, and we simply return. Otherwise, if we do have those values, we set the model state to say, yep, we found the values, these are the values we're going to use. We then access those values, which are by default strings. So then we then parse those strings to dates because a date should conform to a, a, a sort of well-known date structure. And if we parse them and they've both been able to be parsed correctly, now we can create our date range object here. Um, and so this date range object uh, takes the start date and end date. Then we set the result on the binding context as successful, and we set the object that we successfully bound. If this fails, so if there's an argument exception because the end date's invalid, for example, then we again set model state as failed and we'll add a model error there. So that's pretty much the binder. There's two ways we can add binding support to an application. So the first is in um, the configure services method. When we add MVC or we add controllers in this example, we can add to the model binder provider list a model binder provider specifically for our requirements. We insert this one in position zero so it runs first. And this model binder provider is a fairly simple class that implements iModel binder provider. And it then has this get binder method. And on here, we get access to the model type that's trying to be bound. And so our comparison is if it's a date range, yes, we can supply a date range binder for that. If not, we'll return null, which means we haven't found a suitable binder. And then the other providers will get asked, can you, can you match this then? This works if you don't own the type. In this example, we own the date range struct. So what we can actually do is add an attribute directly to it that controls a model binder that's used as well. So if you own the type, this attribute based approach is quite straightforward. Um, if you don't own the type and it's from some external library and you can't modify it, uh, then maybe you would use the model binder provider approach. So let's see how this works. If I go to uh, another endpoint that we're going to call, so by range, we provide the start date and an end date, and we're going to make the request. You can see, yep, we get, we get a result. If um, I change the date on this so that the start date is um, earlier than the end date, which we consider invalid in our system, and send again. Uh, you'll see now we get a 400 bad request from the system, and it gives us the detail of what's failed in our model. So because we've added this custom model binder in, we've added this additional logic. I'll undo that so I don't forget in a moment. After model binding has run, uh, the next phase is action filters. So these implement the I action filter interface, and these are Basically, like the filters that have come before them, the main difference is at this point, we know the bound parameters of the, the request. So we have actual access to those bound arguments, basically. And we can look at those values and make decisions about whether we let the request continue. So this is another place where you might apply some kind of validation logic. And we'll look at that shortly. Again, they may choose to short circuit the request path um, and just immediately return. Otherwise, what they're going to do is execute the action method. So this is where MVC and the framework is just actually going to call, finally, your action method code, anything that you've written inside that action method. And so in some applications, this may be the first place in the entire pipeline after all of this stuff has run, where it's actually running user code, code you've provided. Everything else could all be the default middleware and the default model binders. So the action method gets invoked, and after it gets invoked, we get the on action executed called on the filter. So again, it's another sort of double uh, double filter where we're on the way in and on, on the way out. So again, we'll have a quick look at a, a, a short demo for this one. So let's take this binding scenario a little bit further. So on my books controller, where I accept this, we accept a date range, and we've validated it's a valid date range through binding it. But maybe in this action method, and maybe in more than just this action method, we have a requirement that we only allow the date range to be two years, because maybe looking up anything more than two years is too much data for some reason. And so if we had to apply that once, we could do it inside this action method. We could compare the start and end dates, and if it's greater than two years, return some kind of bad request result. But if we want to do that in multiple action methods, that's going to be code that we'd have to repeat. So let's, let's be dry and not repeat ourselves. So what we can do is we can create a filter, which I've applied in this case to this particular action method, two year date range filter. And in here, the logic is fairly straightforward as well. So on action executing, we're going to see if the action arguments contains a value called date range. And if so, is it of type date range? And if it is, 
is that date range greater than two years? If it's greater than two years, then instead of actually passing this through, we're going to short circuit by setting the result again. Um, and we're going to set a bad request um, object result here. So this is a bad request with some payload. And in this case, it's a uh, problem details response that includes the error message. So now if I uh, make a request to my endpoint again, but this time, uh, well, there we go. We've already got 2012 on there and 2019. So that's greater than two years. If I make my request now, instead of hitting the action method, it's been filtered out. Um, it's probably even easier to see that if I put um, a break point on here. So this is the action method. If we do that one more time, it's immediately been returned a response by short circuiting inside the, the filter mechanism. So this is cross-cutting concerns in the case of our application that we've been able to apply as a filter. We're nearly there. After action filters um, and after action execution, there is the possibility that our action method threw an exception. So we had some kind of exception in our code or code that we called down into that we haven't appropriately handled. So obviously, we don't want to blow up the entire web server just because one request has caused an exception. So exception filters are about dealing with those exception cases and setting an appropriate response. There is a default behavior inside MVC that will handle this for us. But if you want to, you can write your own I exception filter and in its on exception method, control what happens. So back to the demo. Um, and let's take a look at that example. So here is my exception filter. Um, you can see it uh, inherits from I exception filter. It has an on exception method. And in here, what I'm choosing to do is record a metric to a metric system. So this is a really good use case for this, which is if an exception occurs in the application that's unhandled, wouldn't it be nice if our alerting and monitoring system knew about that and could maybe alert us in Slack or something? Well, this is exactly what we do in our system. So we have uh, an exception occurring, we record a metric, and then downstream our notifications come out. The other thing we're doing in here is we've got our own custom format in this API of what an error message looks like. So this is the model for that error, it has a message and it has a, a flag is error. And so inside our code, we actually can construct and return an instance of that as a a uh, serialized JSON object. Um, and then we just set this exception handle to true so that any other exception filters know actually this has already been dealt with. I don't need to do that. The way we can register this is we can add it to controllers or actions, but I've registered this one in my startup class into this filters collection. So this is where we add filters globally that apply to all controllers and all actions, which is really useful for something like exception handling. So with that exception in the framework, if I come in and make a call to an endpoint. Uh, called bang, we'll run that. Uh, we got an unhandled exception here. Now this could be deep down into our code, but the only way to prevent this with our own code would be to wrap this in a try catch. And that may not be very pretty if you have to have a try catch in every action method. So by adding our filter handling, we don't need the try catch, we catch the exception in the exception filter instead. So if we let this continue, um, I don't know why that's run twice, uh, the request comes through and you can see here, our nicely formatted exception message that we decided to return as a signature of this API. So we're coming towards the end, uh, but there's still a little bit more in the, in the pipeline. So after all of this is run, the final set of filters that are going to run are result filters. So the main difference with what these have access to that we didn't have access to earlier is we now have the action result or the I action result that was returned by our action method assuming there was no exception. So the I action result is that sort of representation of the data that our response is going to include, but it hasn't yet been written to the response content. So at this point, we can, in this filter, make some further decisions based on the type of action result or even the data within uh, the action result uh, if we have a cross-cutting concern. We'll look at one in a second, but action filters, uh, sorry, result filters run, and then the action result itself gets executed. And this is where um, in an API, for example, the action result is going to be turned into the appropriate response, probably with a JSON payload. So the way that works is if your request includes an object, uh, sorry, your result includes an object, that, that object is going to run through an output formatter. And by default, that will be the JSON output formatter. And that will serialize the object to JSON and then add that onto the uh, response stream. You can, again, add your own output formatters. So if you want to send a different type of data, you can do that uh, by adding that formatter into the framework. 
uh, for again, protobuf, message pack, or some custom proprietary format that you have. And at this stage, now on the HTTP context, we have the HTTP response uh, with the data added to it. So headers will have been added and the actual content will be written out to it. And then the request, uh, sorry, the response now flows through, back through that middleware um, uh, filter pipeline all the way out to the middleware at the end there. So let's have a look at um, one of those um, result filters quickly and just get an idea of where we could use those. So here I have a result filter. This is the last uh, modified result filter. And what I'm doing here is I'm saying if the result type is OK object result, and if the value of that, so the object inside the OK object result, is of type mutable output model base, which is a really terribly named type I added, this is a base type that I use for my um, output models in this example. So this includes a last modified date. So we assume anything that can be modified in the database will be mapped to a output model that derived from this. And here's the rest of the book data. But what this means is because we have this kind of type that we can look for, we can now say, well, okay, if it is that type, we'll set the last modified response header to the last modified uh, value from the actual object. So we're, having, we're adding a header on here in this example. This is why we do this on result executing, not executed, because we need to write the headers before the output formatter writes the response body, because we can't have headers after the response body. So this is going to run, and if we make a request to this endpoint, um, send that request through. So we've got our response, it includes the last modified date, and on the headers here, we've now added our last modified header um, with the value that we, we've got out of the database. And this, this filter is again referenced globally. So this applies to every controller and every action where it's an object result being returned of that type. Um, and so this is again, another place to apply these cross-cutting concerns um, and could even be used with certain type kinds of caching, for example, if you have specific requirements to do so. So this is the kind of final picture that we're about as deep as we're going to go. Um, there have been some generalizations that I've had to make to fit this into, into the hour. But the key points are those first three filters, authorization, resource, and middleware, are pretty much redundant today. With endpoint routing, uh, which you should be using if you're using 3.0 or 3.1, um, basically give us the same functionality but lift it up outside of MVC. And so you can do authorization with authorization middleware. You can uh, base your sort of resource filter logic inside middleware by making it endpoint aware. So calling get endpoints on the context and then interpreting uh, any uh, attributes of that endpoint, any metadata about it. Uh, and similarly with middleware filters, you can conditionally apply your middleware. Controller creation is gonna happen. And the first then phase is model binding. So this is where, again, we map properties and data from the request onto the types and the um, arguments of our action method. We then run the action execution phase. So this is where the action invoker is going to run and call our actual code. So if you haven't done any previous customization, this is the first chance where your code is going to run. We then get the action result, the I action result from that action method. And before we execute it, we run it through a filter again so we can make a final last minute decision to do something unusual. Um, and then if not, we execute the action result which may or may not use an output formatter to produce the, the serialized data that's going to go onto the response. And then all of this flows back out of MVC um, as a response that's added onto that HTTP context. We flow back into the middleware. So a reminder, we come out of whatever endpoint, whatever action method inside MVC was called, and we flow through each of the middleware. And the response is set now, so those middleware components can potentially log that information or potentially do something um, related to that data, uh, potentially decide to even replace the response entirely. And then the HTTP context flows to Kestrel, and Kestrel is going to take that data from the HTTP context, turn it into a HTTP response message as bytes that it sends down to the client. And just to kind of close the picture, here's the response message from our earlier request. So the server said, great, I've been able to do this request for you. So it's a 200 OK response. It's included some headers. So some of these headers, such as the server header, have been added by Kestrel itself. Uh, some of these are going to be added by sort of MVCs, such as the content type that we ended up creating and adding to the response. And we've even got our last modified header, 
that we added using our eye result filter inside ASP.NET Core. The response content then uh, is the serialized JSON representation of an array of books in this example. Um, and so this was produced by that output formatter, which saw the, the object that we attached to our eye action result. It saw the object, it knew how to serialize that into valid JSON, and then it attached it to the HTTP context and onto the response. So lots and lots of stuff there. Um, the main thing is don't expect you, you need to use all of these things in all of your applications. Most of the time, the defaults are going to be working pretty well for you. But if there is code that you find yourself repeating, particularly across numerous action methods, do think about whether that could be better applied as some kind of filter at the appropriate place in the pipeline, and then just use attributes to apply that behavior where you need it. In summary, uh, the requests are handled in ASP.NET Core by Kestrel. So that's responsible for parsing uh, bytes off of the wire into a HTTP context and passing it into the rest of ASP.NET Core, and later uh, producing the bytes that go out back out to the client. We have the middleware pipeline. It's executed in the order that they're registered, so from top to bottom of the configure method, and the response flows back through in the reverse order. And finally, we have this concept of endpoints, which is new in sort of 3.0, 3.1. Uh, endpoints are really just uh, an action that's going to invoke um, and handle our request, and that may run through the filter pipeline first, which may or may not decide to short circuit that, that request handling. Eventually, the action method gets executed, which returns an I action result, and then the I action result is going to get executed to return the final content. So lots and lots of stuff there. Um, terrible animations coming across over five frames a second. Um, the link that I mentioned earlier, so these slides and all of the sample code, which is up on my GitHub, is at that link there, bit.ly forward slash ASP.NET Anatomy. Um, that should take you to that. And I've included some other resources there. So some links to the Microsoft documentation that cover this stuff pretty well as well. Um, you can find me online. I'm at Steve J. Gordon on Twitter. So if you have any questions that I haven't kind of covered off, I'll do my best to answer them there. Um, we've got like a minute left here. So I don't think we'll probably do too many questions on the chat. But what I'll do is as soon as we've uh, kind of concluded, I'll, I'll jump into the Slack channel for this room um, and we can kind of keep the discussion going there or, or uh, over DMs if you prefer, if you if you prefer to do that. So hopefully that was useful. Hopefully um, that's the information you were looking for. Um, lots and lots of stuff there to take away and apply to what you're building. Thank you very much for coming along and, and hopefully next year I will see you in person uh, at NDC Osley. Thank you.